What can you tell us about managing the toxicities of the BRAF MEC combinations? I guess there are three of them that are out there. Two combinations are approved. One is still in experimental uh, investigational trials, but you know, we know lots about treating IPI and NEVO and PEMBRO toxicity, but what can you tell us about treating the toxicity of patients that get BRAF MEC inhibitors? It's well, so it's worth understanding the differences between these two approved and one coming uh, combinations because it can really come down to a patient level selection about which toxicities they might be more prone to or would be more worrisome in terms of choosing which one. So for the combination of dibrafenib and trametinib, which was the first combination that was approved, really the major toxicity that I think of and I think most think of is really the pyrexia syndrome or fever syndrome that patients can have. And that really can be um, uh, a little bit of a, a syndrome, like I said. It can really range from chills um, all the way up to relapsing fevers to 105. So really, the, that's the one I'm mostly looking for. And what I really tell my patients is, is any signs that you see of disproportionate fatigue, definitely fever, anything, just stop taking the drugs, call our clinic and let us know. And usually if we let it wash out, patient can restart and do quite well. Uh, I really reinforce the idea that a couple of days off of the drug is going to have no impact whatsoever on whether or not the drug works. And that's really important for them to understand. In the vemurafenib and cobimetinib combinations, toxicities are slightly different. We see more cutaneous toxicities uh, associated with the vemurafenib, as well as some more GI uh, toxicities. So again, how these might play with uh, comorbid disease in any individual patient is really sort of important to take home. Uh, and then the uh, final combination of encorafenib and binimetinib is likely to be coming in the relatively near future. Um, a little bit uh, of both, there's a little bit of pyrexia, there's a little bit of these other side effects, although I have to say, based on the data that we've seen so far, it looks like that regimen doesn't quite have the more obvious thing that we're all going to have in our brain as the toxicity we're going to look for. I think, broadly speaking, they're going to look fairly similar in terms of their benefits. So then choosing the right one for an individual patient will come down to knowing that patient and know what other comorbidities they might have to be on the lookout for. Okay. Well, let's go back to Mike because another issue is not just BRAF mutated melanoma, but there's another common mutation, the NRAS mutation, maybe 15, 20% of metastatic patients. So again, I mean, do you routinely look at your patients who are NRAS mutated and try to pick NRAS mutated specific therapy for them, or do you lump them in with the BRAF wild type population? And actually, just before I talk about that, just one other test that I do think is worth considering, particularly in, in patients with acral melanoma and mucosal melanoma, are to look for CKIT mutations. Because we do know that those subtypes, and cutaneous uh, melanomas as well at a lower rate, can have targetable CKIT mutations. And there's very good documentation of the response rates ranging from 10 to 50 percent, depending on sort of the common mutations that are present. And so in our molecular testing, that's the other sort of mutation that we consider looking for. Um, it's very clear that NRAS mutations are a driver of, of growth in melanoma that's really supported quite well by functional studies. The challenge we have in melanoma, like all other diseases, is how to overcome it. It's really sort of a, a struggle that goes across all different types of cancer. Um, so at this point, there have been clinical trials showing that MEK inhibitor therapy actually has superior uh, response rates uh, and slight improvement in progression-free survival versus chemotherapy, but that did not result in a benefit in overall survival, and indeed, those differences were relatively small and transient. Um, I do think that there's probably, again, sort of a rationale for clinical trials moving forward with a MEK inhibitor backbone combined with other agents. The other uh, interesting data that's out there that's been reported by a couple different groups, including our own, is seemingly a correlation with patients with uh, NRAS mutations seeming to have better outcomes with immunotherapy than patients uh, with, a, with a BRAF mutation or other, other genotypes may be related to total mutation burden o overall being somewhat higher in those patients. But um, it's, it's one of those things where, to be honest, when we see an NRAS mutation, even though we know we don't have a great targeted therapy option for those patients, we're actually quite optimistic about immunotherapy working in those patients. So you think not only does immunotherapy work in those patients, you think it works better than in non-NRAS mutated patients. Do you think you have enough patients to make that conclusion? Well, I, I think that, you know, again, it's, it's at this point data that's sort of intriguing and it's actually sort of, um, it was really quite surprising. So. Um, data we had seen before was that uh, before the era of the common immunotherapies, when we looked at overall survival in patients with stage 4 disease, we had seen that patients with both BRAF mutations and with NRAS mutations had worse overall survival from stage 4 compared to the BRAF NRAS wild type patients. We saw a marked shift in the outcomes of the BRAF patients with the onset of the BRAF targeted therapies. And so with our uh, historical database of really outcomes with chemotherapy and biochemotherapy, it was pretty striking that the NRAS patients were doing worse. 
And so actually sort of this uh, observation that we've seen with IL-2 and that other groups have seen with checkpoint inhibitors that suggests that the NREST patients are doing better, I think at least was sort of promising, if not, if not absolutely definitive. So just I'm to sorry. support that, sorry, uh, Jeff, just to support that at ASCO this year, uh, we looked at V600E versus V600K, and biologically they're very different. And immunotherapy patients with the V600K mutation did a, he a heap better with immunotherapy than the V600E. And we know from the clinical trials that the reverse is true for V600K and E4. BRAF and MEK inhibitors. And your explanation is? Again, V600K, similar to NRAS, associated with chronic sun damage, high mutational burden, and um, the genetic profile of these tumors, they have a lot more other muta somatic mutations in, in the tumors, but they do extremely well with immune therapies. Okay, so back to Robert. You know, you have the broad perspective on melanoma therapy, in my view. Do you see NRAS mutated therapies or therapies specific for the NRAS mutated population? coming up in the future, meaning will there be a trial that will develop with a registration strategy that's going to get these drugs approved by the FDA? I think there may be, you know, do that, but I think that we're still very early in, in all of that, Jeff, to really determine if what drugs are we going to use, how effective are they going to be, are we going to use monotherapy for those, will they be in combination, and if so, what combination will we use? And I think also back to Mike's point earlier as well is that in this, will this be a combination between then targeted therapy as well as immunotherapy in this setting, since uh, we know that these patients may respond a bit better to immunotherapy. So I think that we, we don't know yet, Jeff, where we stand with this. Um, an additional point that I'd like to add also, which actually Jason touched on here, I think that we're talking about targeted therapy and we're talking about sort of the, the majority of patients are responding very well to the brf mec combinations. But I think what we see or what I see increasingly as a surgeon is that I see that the majority of lesions are responding, but then you have clonal selection and you have one area that is then growing. And the question then becomes, what do we do at that point in time? And what we are doing increasingly, we're doing surgical resection of those clones that are growing and then continuing the therapy. The other uh, thing to think about also is to switch therapy at that point in time and switch to immunotherapy. Additionally, we also have clinical trials going, ongoing right now trying to answer the question, should we have continuous treatment for BRAF mech therapy or do we need to cycle this and have intermittent treatment? There is a SWOG trial ongoing right now looking at continuous therapy versus intermittent therapy. And I think so there are many questions in terms of the potential resistance and how we deal with these uh, for these patients. Yes, and then the, the final issue with BRAF mech inhibition is whether it's active in the brain. And actually, Mike presented some very nice data today. So why don't you tell us if you see a mutated patient with brain metastases, will you want to put him on BRAF mech inhibition or would you want to put him in view of data that we'll discuss later, also yeah. presented in your session, would you want to put him on immunotherapy? Yeah, so uh, so so as not to uh, spoil the data we'll talk about later, the, the results that we presented today was the COMBI-MB study, a phase two trial of patients with BRAF mutant metastatic melanoma with brain metastases. And we sort of treated different cohorts of patients depending on what type of BRAF mutation they had, whether or not they'd had prior uh, therapies directed to the brain. And what we saw consistently across those groups was a very high initial response rate. So response rates sort of in about the 60% range, and disease control rates of approximately 80%. These are actually very comparable to what we've seen in patients with extracranial disease only, albeit a little bit lower. Um, what was striking though was is that the duration of the responses we saw in the patients with brain metastases, and specifically in the brain metastases, were much shorter than what we've seen in other clinical trials with dabrafenib trametinib. So that on average, the duration of response we were seeing with dabrafenib trametinib was about six months, as opposed to approximately 12 months months that we've seen in trials of patients with extracranial disease only. So I think it's there's clear there's a signal of activity there, but there clearly is something uh, different about the activity of dabrafenib trametinib in brain metastases compared to extracranial disease, and that was even seen within the patients within the trial. The most common pattern of progression was progression in the brain only without progression outside of the brain. Uh, and the real question that we have to figure out is what is it that's driving that differential response and how do we sort of build upon these results to, to do better.